Stan Temple is our speaker for today. Stan is a senior fellow with the Elder Depot Foundation. From his arrival in Madison in 1976 until he retired 10 years ago or so, he was the Beers Bascom Professor of Conservation, which is the same chair, the same professorship that Elder Depot held. So he is a close relative, grand grandchild, I guess. <laughs> And uh, Stan will talk today about uh, some developments that took place in the past, and on Thursday as usual, uh, we'll talk about things that are going on now. Okay, Dave. Well, I, I know the uh, title of the course is Groundbreaking Discoveries, but actually what I'm going to talk about today is more of a groundbreaking insight that Aldo Leopold had some 75 years ago that unbeknownst to him, of course, would end up today having some very important implications for understanding how plants and animals are responding to anthropogenic climate change. So I've titled the talk Aldo Leopold Phenology and Climate Change. Aldo Leopold, of course, was a famous University of Wisconsin professor, arguably one of the giants in modern conservation. And he had a lifelong passion for studying the timing of seasonal events, and that's called phenology, studying how the variations from year to year uh, play out in terms of seasonal events like the flowering of plants and the arrival of migratory birds and so on. And Aldo Leopold had no idea, of course, that his meticulous records that he had collected throughout his life would end up decades later being an important historical database for understanding how climate change is affecting plants and animals. So the cover photograph here is of Aldo Leopold's uh, shack, his weekend getaway um, up in Sauk County on the banks of the Wisconsin River where he wrote the book, A Sand County Almanac. How many of you have read A Sand County Almanac? Oh, most of you have. For the rest of you, mm, homework assignment. Uh, get yourself a copy and read it. It's an important part of not only Wisconsin history, uh, but also of uh, American conservation history. So Aldo Leopold wrote several papers about phenology, about seasonal events. And in one of the papers, he, he said this, keeping records enhances the pleasures of the search and the chance of finding order and meaning in these events. And that's sort of the theme that I'm going to follow up on here. Leopold recorded these events not because he was testing some hypothesis, not because he knew that someday these would be valuable historical records. He kept these records because it just documented the good times that he and his family and his students had when they were out in the field. And Leopold would retrospectively go back and look at his field notes and himself try to find order and meaning in what he had observed. And of course, that's exactly what we're doing now many decades uh, later. Uh -oh. So for any, how many of you have been to the shack? A few of you have been to the shack. Okay, yeah. You may remember there's a lilac bush planted at the corner of the shack. The shack was an abandoned chicken coop when Aldo Leopold bought the farm and they fixed it up to make their weekend getaway. And Aldo Leopold's wife, Estella, uh, planted this uh, lilac bush in the, uh, in the corner of the, uh, of the shack. And it's still the, the same plant, and remember that because I'm going to refer to it later in the talk. So for most people, if they know about Aldo Leopold, it's because he wrote this book, A Sand County Almanac. And for those of you who have read the book, you realize that the first half of the book is essentially derived from Aldo Leopold's phenological records. It's a month-by-month -month accounting of the seasonal events as they unfolded at the Leopold um, shack. Leopold never lived to see this book in, in print. And in the uh, introduction to the book, he basically without knowing that he was going to, uh, to die, realized uh, that this book was really the end result of his life journey. It was the summation of all the things that he had learned during his uh, quite remarkable uh, career in conservation. 
So the one thing that was constant throughout this life journey of Aldo Leopold's was keeping phenological records. He did this from the age of eight, literally until hours before he died at age 61. So the life journey that he wrote about, though, started out as a boy studying natural history and hunting and fishing and bird watching and outdoor activities. Um, and natural history was really an important part of Leopold's life. Natural history, for those of you who've probably visited a natural history museum, you know the term, but natural history was a branch of science, if you will, that relied on observation of nature, making meticulous observations of nature, and then retrospectively trying to make sense out of what you had observed. It's not the modern scientific method where you pose a hypothesis and then go out and collect data uh, to, to test the hypothesis. So for Leopold, keeping records was all about his childhood experiences in natural history. And at that time, keeping phenological records was a big part of it. He started his career um, in forestry because at the time, in the early 20th century, that was literally the only profession um, that you could <coughs> enter that had the opportunity for college-level education. He quickly, though, turned his attention to wildlife conservation, which was his real passion. He starts the first half of his career working for the U.S. Forest Service in the Southwest, working on publicly owned wildlands. Mid-career, he comes back to Wisconsin and becomes a professor at the University of Wisconsin and spends the rest of his time working on rural working lands here in the Midwest. He became fascinated with our relationship with what he calls land. Land was the term that Aldo Leopold used to encompass what today we might say is the ecosystem. It's soils and water and plants and animals and humans all interacting together. And the end result, as he described it, was an idea that was Aldo Leopold's groundbreaking contribution, and it was his land ethic, the idea that our relationship with land with the ecosystems, with the biosphere, has to have an ethical underpinning. There have to be some moral guidelines, some moral compasses, if you will, that govern our behavior with respect to the rest of the, uh, the planet. But for today, um, it all starts when he's a very young boy growing up in Burlington, Iowa, under the influence of two parents, his father, who was a great outdoorsman, and who encouraged his son to spend as much time as possible out of doors enjoying nature, and his mother, who insisted that her son not only be well read, but that he could write well. And one of the things that she required him to do from the age of eight was keep a daily journal. This was much more common back in the late 19th century than it is now. And there was a third influence on Aldo Leopold that clearly had a big influence on his journaling. And that was a program called the Nature Study Program. It was one of the country's earliest attempts at what today we might call environmental education. But it was aimed at school children. It encouraged them to go out and take notes on what they observed in nature or photograph things in nature. And then, using the natural history approach, come back and try to make sense out of what they had observed. So the combination of father, mother, and school programs, Aldo Leopold started keeping these journals. And they are not the typical journals that you might expect of an adolescent boy. Instead, they're keeping phenological records, which was part of the nature study movement, was actually encouraging students to organize their journals along seasonal um, events. So here's an entry. You know, he talks about, uh, you know, the quail are still in flocks um, on April 18th, bats are starting to fly, and the blooming plants that he saw blooming. So basically, Aldo Leopold, from the age of eight, documents almost every day of his life, but it doesn't tell you much about what he's doing, it's telling you what he's observing in nature. So he goes away to school, back east, to boarding school, and uh, his handwriting gets better. But he's still keeping these lists of dates of when he sees things happening. In this case, 
It's his summary of the spring bird migration in, in 1903. And up to this point, Leopold's record keeping, his journaling, was basically these sort of simple lists. There wasn't really much that he wrote about the things. It was just, okay, this happened on such and such a date. But there was something interesting that happened while he was away at boarding school in New Jersey, and that is for the first time in his journals, he starts to interpret the things that he is observing. And some of those insights are remarkable for um, a teenage uh, boy. So in this case, here's a journal entry from March of 1904. Aldo Leopold in his journal is noting that the first Eastern Phoebe has arrived. Eastern Phoebes are a little insectivorous bird, a migratory bird, and um, they do arrive very early in the spring, often so early that they get caught by bad weather. And if you're a small bird that depends on flying insects for food, a period of cold weather is basically a death sentence. So for example, last week, a lot of early arriving Phoebes died in Wisconsin with our horrible um, weather. But Leopold makes an observation here that's really quite remarkable. He's making a, an ecological connection between a plant and an animal. He's observing that the early arriving Phoebes cluster around skunk cabbage. Skunk cabbage is a very early blooming spring plant and it's unique, as the name implies, it smells, but it's also unique in that it can generate heat. So in cold weather, when flying insects are grounded in most places, there can be flying insects around a skunk cabbage patch. And if Phoebe is lucky enough to have a patch of skunk cabbage near its territory, it could possibly be saved during a stretch of cold weather where other Phoebes might uh, starve. So it's kind of remarkable that he's made a connection now between two species and he's writing about it. He's sort of describing these things. So a couple of years ago, I got to, uh, to visit Leopold's uh, uh, boarding school, Lawrenceville School in New Jersey, and part of the uh, requirement of the visit was not only to give a bunch of talks, but to take the students out on a field trip. So I said, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to Leopold's journals, and we're gonna try to revisit some of the places uh, that he visited when he was in school, which, by the way, it's remarkable that he graduated because he spent a lot of time out in the field rather than in the classroom. Most of the places now in central New Jersey, um, of course, don't resemble what they did in Leopold's time, but did discover that the big woods in Leopold's notes, this is a little sketch that he did in his notebook, <coughs> the big woods was still there. It's now a nature reserve. And the big woods happened to be the place where Leopold made the Phoebe and skunk cabbage observation. And I happened to be there about the same time. So I said, well, here's the quest. We're gonna go out and we're gonna see what's going on over in the big woods. And wouldn't you know it, right where those two streams come together, that's where the skunk cabbage patch was. And it still is a huge patch of skunk cabbage about the size of this room. We didn't see any Phoebes, but the kids were ecstatic that there were still skunk cabbage there. So Leopold graduates from high school, goes to Yale, and gets one of the first degrees in forestry that was offered in the country. And like all of the graduates of the Yale School of Forestry, he was snapped up immediately by the then brand new US Forest Service and shipped off to the Arizona and New Mexico territories. They weren't even states. And this 22-year-old guy, fresh out of Yale, is suddenly responsible for managing millions of acres of publicly owned wild lands. Not the least of which was figuring out what's on that land, so doing a lot of backcountry um, reconnaissance. He spends the first half of his career there, eventually gets transferred to the U.S. Forest Products Lab in Madison, Wisconsin, which many of you have probably seen up at the top of the hill over on Walnut Street. Um, and he only lasted a couple of years there, very unhappy with that position, and he quit, cold turkey, which was a pretty remarkable thing to do given that it was uh, 1928, the Great Depression. He had a high-paying, secure government job that wasn't asking him to do much except pursue his own interests. 
He had a wife and five kids at home, and he quits cold turkey without any idea what he's going to do next, but he decides he really is tired with the Forest Service and forestry. He wants to pursue wildlife conservation. So he does for a few years as an independent contractor, but then in 1933, an even more remarkable thing happens, and that is that the University of Wisconsin hires this guy for a professorship. Now again, you have to think, 1933, it's still the tail end of the Great Depression. The university's budget had to be in probably as bad a shape or worse shape than it is now. Faculty positions must have been very precious in the College of Agriculture at that time. And yet the dean of the college did something that seemed daft at the time. He <laughs> hires this guy, Aldo Leopold, who has no graduate degree, has never taught a course in his life, and who represents a field, wildlife management, wildlife conservation, that had never before been present in the halls of academia. It seemed like an amazing flying leap. It was obviously a good investment that paid off. But at the time, certainly Aldo Leopold was, was very fortunate that the College of Agriculture had uh, an administration that was far-sighted enough to realize that an investment in somebody who was a, a pioneer, really in a field like Aldo Leopold, uh, was a worthwhile investment. So shortly after he gets the professorship, Aldo Leopold acquires this farm up in Sauk County on the banks of the Wisconsin River, which he affectionately called his, his shack. And it was during the period of time from 1935 until Aldo Leopold dies in 1948 that his journaling reaches its pinnacle, when the detail of his field notes, especially the ones that he was collecting at the shack, the ones that his students were collecting at the brand new University of Wisconsin Arboretum, these were amazing field notes. They were monitoring over 300 native species of plants and animals, a really remarkable data set that they assembled. Um, and of course, Aldo Leopold retrospectively used um, those observations to write the first half of a Sand County Almanac, which is a month-by-month -month account of what's happening on a seasonal basis at the shack. So here's what Aldo Leopold's field notes look like. And they're all preserved in the University of Wisconsin uh, <clears throat> archives at Steenbach Library. So they're handwritten. Leopold would take his field notes in a little pocket notebook that he carried out in the field with him, and he'd take some notes shorthand, but when he returned uh, for the evening, he would write them all out longhand in the journal. So you can see here that uh, this is May 4th and 5th of 1940. Uh, two inches of snow fell May 1st, uh, but he goes on to talk about phenology. And there's just a long list of things that he and the family observed that weekend um, that they thought were significant enough to, uh, to, to make note of. Some plants that are blooming, some birds that are arriving, and so forth. And you'll also notice that over some of those observations, there's a little tick mark. And that tick mark indicates that Aldo Leopold has retrospectively gone back to his journals and he has now extracted that observation as a piece of data that he is going to use in an analysis, retrospectively trying to find order and meaning in all of these observations. And you'll note that one of the uh, events that has a tick mark over it is the arrival of the great crested flycatcher. The great crested flycatcher is a neotropical migratory bird uh, and you'll notice that it's arrived for the first time the first week in May. Um, remember that, because I'll return to that later as well. So in 1945, when Leopold was making those little tick marks, going back over a decade of observations, this was at the time a monumental task that had to be done pretty much by hand. So Leopold did his analysis using what I like to call a 1945 Excel spreadsheet. It was hundreds of pages of graph paper in which he meticulously plotted out all of these observations for over 300 species of plants and animals and tried to figure out 
by year when the first observation of the event uh, occurred. So it must have taken him hundreds of hours to do this by hand. And even once you had it all written out on paper, you still had to integrate all of this without the help of a computer to make some sense out of it, to figure out what the order and meaning actually was. So in 1945, uh, Leopold finished a decade of these observations, and he wrote a monograph, a very important paper. This is the insightful part of the, uh, of the talk. He writes this paper and gets it published in the premier ecological journal of North America, Ecological Monographs, published by the then very new Ecological Society of America. And the Ecological Society of America at the time was actually struggling, you might say, to convince the rest of the scientific community that ecology wasn't just another name for natural history, that this was real science, that this was a natural science that involved testing hypotheses and, and doing things that we generally recognize as modern science rather than old-fashioned natural history. So the fact that Aldo Leopold got this big monograph published in the premier journal was somewhat bucking the tradition of the day, which was to kind of play down the natural history roots of ecology. I suspect there was a reason when the paper was published, Aldo Leopold was the president-elect of the Ecological Society of America, and I suspect the journal editor would not have uh, easily rejected a paper by the incoming president. But, as you might predict, this paper, which is an incredibly insightful paper, about how climate and phenology affect native species of plants and animals. Just an incredibly insightful paper that uh, we're very thankful that Leopold uh, published. But it went nowhere. As you might suspect, phenology was kind of being snubbed by ecologists. This paper is hardly ever cited in the intervening, in the following years, and it remained pretty much um, an unknown work or little known work to a very small community um, until climate change started to become a topic for scientific research. And fast forward, Aldo Leopold's daughter returns to Wisconsin in her retirement and builds her retirement home just down the road from the shack. And remembering the good times that she and the family had when she was a girl going out and recording phenological observations and to some extent competing with her four siblings to see who could find the first bird or the first flower, Nina resumed keeping phenological records. And like her father, after she was doing this because it was the pleasure of the search. It was basically recording her daily walks, really, uh, around the vicinity of her home and the shack. But after a while, she did just what her father did. She started to look back at her notes and realize that, hey, there's a pattern here. And the pattern was that quite a few of the events were happening earlier, much earlier in many cases than they did in her father's time. And she published this short little paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences saying that, you know, of the things that I'm keeping close tabs on, some, but not all, of the things that I'm monitoring are happening much earlier. Other things are happening pretty much at the same time as my father observed them. And she pointed out that this was consistent with climate change. Well, you all know what happens, of course, if you publish something having to do with climate change. The, uh, the critics will jump all over you. And they jumped all over Nina's paper. They said, for heaven's sakes, a lot of things have changed in you know, the decades since Aldo Leopold did his work, um, not the least of which is that the entire landscape around the Leopold shack has changed because of the ecological restoration work that Aldo Leopold and his family did. An interstate highway went a half mile away from the shack, and on and on. How can you single out climate change as being responsible for these changes that you observed. 
Well, Nina was, of course, on safe ground because the climate, spring climate in March, April, and May, it actually had warmed significantly since Aldo's time by 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit since, uh, since Aldo's time. So she was correct in that these observations were consistent, you might say, with the idea that warming spring temperatures were causing some events to happen earlier. And her father had written about the same thing. Over the 10 years of data that he recorded, Wisconsin had warm springs and cold springs, and Leopold himself noted that when you had a cold spring, some plants and animals were sort of retarded in when their seasonal events happened. If it was a very warm spring, the event was advanced. So she was essentially, you know, repeating the same sort of insight that her father had had. So if you look at some examples, columbine, an early flowering uh, uh, wildflower, uh, in all those uh, data, the average flowering time was May 19th. In Nina's data, the average was May 9th, so 10 days earlier. On the other hand, a plant like dogbane um, is flowering at essentially the same time that it did back in, in Aldo's time. This pattern of some species apparently changing the timing of their seasonal events in response to climate change and others not is sort of dominant, you might say, in, in the data set. Aldo Leopold, in his essays in the Sand County Almanac, of course, picked some iconic event for each month of the year. And for those of you who have read the Sand County Almanac, you'll know that the iconic event for the month of July was the blooming of the compass plant. Well, it was perfect. The average in all those time, it bloomed right in the middle of July. Perfect species to write an essay about. Now, it wouldn't even be appropriate to write about it for the month of July because they're now blooming um, in, in June. The same sort of pattern held for animals as well. So some birds are changing their migratory timing and other birds aren't. So one group of birds, the resident birds that are with us year round here in Wisconsin, um, they are showing a very strong response in that their seasonal events are happening much earlier than they did in Aldo's time. So for northern cardinals, when they first start to give their territorial song in the spring, in Aldo's time, February 15th, now, oh, sorry, February 27th, and, and now much earlier um, in February. And this was true of most of the resident birds. They were really shifting so that the average time at which they were doing their seasonal activities advanced. The same was true of short distance migrants, the ones that have spent the winter really only hundreds of miles south of Wisconsin. They are arriving now much earlier than they did back in all those times. So American robins, for example, are now arriving a full two weeks on average earlier. It's getting hard to keep track of this one because robins now no longer even leave Wisconsin. They're with us year round. And it's actually kind of amusing right now to watch the arrival of the migrant birds who had spent their winter down in Missouri and Arkansas and Mississippi. The birds that spent the winter with us spent the winter feeding on berries up in trees. The migrants arrive back in Wisconsin, and you'll see them out on these rock-hard frozen lawns out there trying to find worms that are, of course, about three feet down under, uh, wondering why there are no worms. There should be worms here. But in any event, uh, the short-distance migrants are responding. The long-distance migrants, the birds that have spent the winter down in the tropics, aren't responding at all. They're still arriving pretty much on the same schedule. So here are two closely related species, the American robin and the wood thrush. So we're not comparing apples and oranges. The American robin is advancing its arrival. The wood thrush, having spent the uh, winter in Costa Rica or somewhere in Central America, still arriving at the same schedule which sort of makes sense. If you're lucky enough to be spending the winter in Costa Rica, you don't have a clue what the climate is doing up here. So 
for these long distance migrants, they are timing their migration movement, not by temperature, but by photo period, by day length. And day length is consistent from year to year. So it's not surprising that they're using the same consistent queue to begin migrating northward and they're arriving pretty much at the same date. We haven't figured out a way to screw up photo period. We'll probably get around to that sooner or later. So remembering how Nina's paper had been criticized because it hadn't really drawn a cause and effect relationship between temperature and all of these events, I reanalyzed the Leopold data set to actually do a, a more uh, convincing job of making a cause and effect relationship. So rather than doing the then versus now, comparing the average in the past to the average now, you could actually go back and from the records, meteorological records, climatological records, as well as the Leopold records, you could actually see, well, what is the relationship between temperature in a given year and when events actually happen? So I was able to do this with a couple of hundred species of, of plants and animals. And as you are all painfully aware from last week and from this spring, Wisconsin springs in March, April, and May are all over the map. There is certainly a trend for springs to be warmer than in the past, but we have warm springs when things happen early. We have cold springs when things happen late. So if you look at this, the climatological record for southern Wisconsin, the long-term average, the red peaks are springs when the average temperature in March, April, and May was warmer than normal, and the blue troughs when it was colder than normal. So as I was doing this analysis, I discovered that we actually had a lot more data for south central Wisconsin. This fellow, A.W. Shorger, Bill Shorger, um, an amazing Madisonian, a contemporary of Aldo Leopold's, uh, kept phenological records all the way back to his arrival in Madison as a grad student in chemistry. And his records go all the way back to 1908. And like Aldo Leopold, he was a product of the nature study movement. He kept meticulous journals, even better in some cases than Aldo Leopold's, and they're all preserved. So I was able to go back and extract data from Shorger's notes from Aldo Leopold and his family and students in the 30s and 40s, from Nina, myself, I admit that I'm a throwback to the 19th century, I'm a natural historian at heart, I also keep phenological records, but we end up for South Central Wisconsin having the most extensive, both in time and in terms of the number of species that are covered, we have the most extensive phenological records in the country. There are records that go back longer for things like cherry blossoms blooming and so forth, but to have over 300 species of native plants and animals monitored for over a century is unprecedented. So what did I learn by going back and looking at, at these historical records from Aldo Leopold and others? Well, remember the robin and the wood thrush. The robin, short distance migrant, looks as though it's arriving earlier than in the past, the wood thrush arriving pretty much on the same schedule. So what does it look like when you plot their arrival date each year by the average spring temperature? Well, as you might guess, for the robin, there's a fairly strong relationship with temperature. So if you look for the arrival of the migrant robins on the coldest average springs of the year, they're of over the data set for the century, they're arriving on the 90th day of the year. On the warmest months in the historical record, they're arriving on the 60th day. So a full month difference in their arrival date based on what the average temperature is. And a fairly strong statistical relationship between the average spring temperature and when they arrive. There's a fair amount of scatter there and you have to imagine that that is not necessarily because of climate, it's due to weather. It's the stuff that hit us last week that can either retard or advance the migration um, and cause it to uh, vary a bit from what you might predict from the average. But there's a fairly consistent pattern that shows up in hundreds of species of plants and animals where there's a strong relationship between temperature and when the seasonal event happens. But compare that to the wood thrush, 
There is no relationship with temperature at all. In fact, these are some of the flattest regression lines I've ever calculated. There just is no relationship to temperature, which is what you would expect for a species that's timing its migration by, by photo period. So by doing this type of analysis, by calculating a regression line, it gives you the ability to do something that you can't do with then versus now types of comparisons. And that is you can extrapolate. You can make predictions. You can sort of say, what if spring temperatures in Wisconsin get warmer than they have ever been in the past? Could we accurately predict what the timing of the seasonal events for these plants and animals might be like under unprecedented conditions? And as you probably know, the climatologists who are modeling the future climates of Wisconsin say, you know, the average spring temperatures are going to be a lot warmer than they have been historically. In fact, for South Central Wisconsin, they're going to be over six degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average than they have been um, historically. So looking at the historical data, going back, I realized that, oh, wow, we don't even have to extrapolate. We actually had observations in 1977 when the spring, the average spring temperature that year was even warmer than what they predict will be the new average by mid-century. So we didn't even have to extrapolate to know how plants and animals are going to respond. We've observed what they will be doing under the average conditions predicted for uh, mid-century. But those are the average spring temperatures for mid-century. You know, based on Wisconsin's climate, that there are going to be years in which it's going to be much warmer than the average. So we are going to be able to want to predict how plants and animals are going to respond to unprecedented warm spring um, conditions. So we got the chance. Maybe some of you who live in Wisconsin will remember 2012. 2012, we set the all-time record, the warmest spring on record for the state. I was like a kid on Christmas Eve waiting for the last of the phenological records to come in in May so that I could see whether our predictions actually were correct, whether we could have predicted based on the historical relationships what was going to happen in 2012. Well, it turned out we could predict very well what happened. I was really excited about this. I started telephoning some of my colleagues around the country who are interested in phenology, and I discovered that, uh, lo and behold, I wasn't the only person who was interested in the same sort of question. So for 2012 here in Wisconsin, I picked 23 spring flowering plants for which we had observations in every year and looked at the relationship between temperature and blooming to see whether uh, we could predict what happened in 2012. When I shared these observations with colleagues, I discovered especially that uh, researchers at Boston University were busy doing exactly the same analysis with Henry David Thoreau's notes at Walden Pond, trying to see whether this unprecedented warm spring of 2012 uh, had produced record early blossoming of plants. It had in Wisconsin, it did um, in Massachusetts. So we published a paper, and maybe like Aldo Leopold publishing his paper back in 1947, we figured how many editors are going to reject a paper based on data collected by Aldo Leopold and Henry David Thoreau, two giants of American conservation. So we published the paper in um, an online journal, which is a very interesting uh, uh, exercise, because you get instant feedback. You don't have to wait months or years for people to uh, respond to your paper. They do it almost immediately. And the responses to our paper, although the data were pretty compelling, um, so here, here are the data plotted for South Central Wisconsin. Here was our 95% confidence prediction. 
and there's where the data actually turned up um, for 2012. But the people who responded were plant physiologists who were doing experiments, not natural history, they were doing experiments in greenhouses in which they were exposing plants to progressively warmer and warmer spring temperatures in a controlled environment. They were using the scientific method, essentially. And what they pointed out was that, well, okay, your data looks pretty good, and what you're showing is that plants are able to respond to the warming spring temperatures, maybe up through what you might be expecting by mid-century, but we know from our lab experiments, from our greenhouse experiments, that this can't go on forever. Eventually, plants reach a physiological limit to how early they can blossom. And they point out that the physiological mechanism for blossoming has both a temperature and a photoperiodic component to it. Many of these early spring blooming plants, the ones that we had specifically focused on in this paper, need a prolonged period of winter chilling to break dormancy. Any of you who are gardeners probably know this, that there are plants that need to have a period of, of cold, a prolonged period of winter cold, to break their dormancy in the spring. If they don't get that, they don't break dormancy on a sort of a normal schedule. So they pointed out that as the climate warms and winter comes later and spring comes earlier, eventually many of these plants aren't going to experience a long enough period of winter chilling in order to break dormancy when these unusual spring temperatures hit them in the spring. Breaking dormancy is one thing. For a plant, that means, you know, starting to grow, starting to photosynthesize. But they said, in addition, even if they could break dormancy early, as you might predict by the warmer spring, blossoming, blooming, requires a critical day length. So the plants might wake up early in the spring, but the days are still too short to trigger blossoming. So they said at some point they reach this critical threshold where either winter chilling or the photo period when they become active in the spring are not going to be conducive to the blossoming that you've used as your indicator, which is probably, which is probably um, correct. But at least for plants in south central Wisconsin, the data suggest that they're probably going to continue to adapt through mid-century. Well, 2012 not only was a record-breaking early blossoming for many species of plants, but it also illustrated some of the other hazards, if you will, of climate change. And uh, what happens for many plants is that if they break dormancy and blossom very early based on climate, they get hit with weather. A cold front comes through, Basically, a killing frost happens and blossoms can be destroyed. I love this headline. Door County, famous for its cherries, had the record earliest blooming of cherry trees in history. And of course, a week later, a big cold front came through. They had a killing frost. All the blossoms were destroyed and the cherry crop was a bust. Meanwhile, in western Wisconsin, apple trees were doing the same thing, blooming at a record early date. So early that the insects weren't active enough to pollinate them. And the apple crop was kind of a, a, of a loss because many of the blossoms simply hadn't been pollinated and didn't uh, produce fruit. So just because you can adapt to climate change doesn't necessarily mean that you're out of the woods. There are some other things that can come in to, uh, to cause problems for, for both plants and animals. So what's the takeaway point in, in Leopold's observations and the ones that have, uh, have followed? Well, one of the things that ecologists now worry about is something that Aldo Leopold was well aware of, and that is that the timing of these seasonal events not only affect individual species, 
but there are interactions between species that can become decoupled if one species is responding to climate change and the other one isn't. So that you can have like the apple trees, a plant blooming before the pollinators are out. You can have birds arriving too late to take advantage of the flush of insects in the spring that they feed their young. We call these phenological mismatches, where two species that have some type of intimate relationship with one another get out of sync, and one or both species suffers because they're no longer timing their seasonal events in a way that allows this partnership uh, to, to continue working. So I wanted you to remember the skunk cabbage and the Phoebe. Skunk cabbage and Phoebe, Leopold pointed out, this was maybe a life or death relationship for an early arriving Phoebe. Skunk cabbage patch could be the emergency food supply uh, when there are no flying insects around. Well, what's happened? Skunk cabbage are an early spring wildflower and they are blooming much earlier than they did in the past. So what about the Phoebes? Turns out Phoebes are short distance migrants. They are responding to climate change and they are pretty much responding in the same way. Phoebes are arriving about one week after skunk cabbage blooms. So that means that when there's inclement weather, an early arriving Phoebe can actually be rescued by the neighborhood skunk cabbage patch. So there's a relationship that's intact. Both species in this relationship are responding the same way. But what about species that end up getting mismatched? Remember I mentioned the great crested flycatcher that in Leopold's notes arrived the first week in May. They're still arriving the first week in May. Long distance migrants using photo period. Well, great crested flycatchers are what we call secondary cavity nesters. They nest in cavities, but they can't create their own cavity. They have to use a pre-existing cavity. Maybe an old woodpecker nest, maybe a broken off tree limb that's rotted, but they have to find a pre-existing cavity in order to, to reproduce. Well, it turns out that since great crested flycatchers are arriving at the same date as always, they have been placed at a tremendous competitive disadvantage. And the competitive disadvantage comes about because cavities in nature are an incredibly scarce and valuable resource. Everything goes after cavities. Insects nest in there, mammals den in there, birds nest in there. Many, many studies have shown that in this intense competition for a good cavity that doesn't leak, that has the right size opening, that has the right internal dimensions, that has the right exposure, the competition is intense. And the winning strategy is to get there first and take possession of the cavity. For the great crested flycatcher, its most significant nest competitor that's after exactly the same type of cavity is the European starling. And they are resident and short distance migrants that are responding very strongly to climate change. They're getting there earlier, claiming the best cavities, and a late arriving flycatcher maybe isn't gonna find a cavity at all, in which case its nesting season is, is over. Or maybe they have to settle for a substandard cavity that leaks or isn't the right dimensions, in which case they wouldn't raise as many young. So there's some pretty serious consequences to losing out in competition for something as essential as a nesting cavity for a bird. So does it make a difference? Well, when you look at the long-term records from the North American Breeding Bird Survey about great crested flycatchers in Wisconsin, since the mid-1960s, they've declined by 30%. And it would be foolish of me to say that that's entirely due to the climate mismatch, the phenological mismatch, but it certainly doesn't help that they're losing out so significantly in competition with, with starlings. So as in my retirement, as I do a lot of public lecturing about Aldo Leopold and his uh, relevance to current contemporary environmental issues. 
inevitably people sort of ask, well, what would Aldo Leopold have said or what would Aldo Leopold have thought about fill in the environmental problem of, of the day? And of course, it would be invidious to try to put words in or thoughts into Aldo Leopold's uh, voice. Um, but Leopold, remember, he thought that his the end result, his perhaps his best gift to us, his real groundbreaking uh, innovation, was this idea of a land ethic, that there has to be an ethical relationship between humans and the natural environment. And he left us a golden rule. Golden rules are always good for to couple with ethics because they provide that sort of simple moral compass of when something is right or wrong. And Aldo Leopold did this beautifully and succinctly when he said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So by that simple golden rule, I think we don't have to imagine that Aldo Leopold would have been a, a vocal uh, critic of anthropogenic uh, climate change. Well, I said that Aldo Leopold kept phenological records till the day he died. He died of a heart attack at age 61, helping a neighbor fight a grass fire up at the shack. Uh, he suffered the heart attack, the grass fire actually swept over his body, and the little pocket notebook in which he kept his, his actual observations in the field um, was in his shirt pocket and, as you can see, uh, was actually scorched by the fire that swept over him. So, as far as we know, Aldo Leopold's last written words, lilac shoots, two inches long, and the only lilac tree anywhere in the vicinity is the lilac tree that his wife, Estella, planted at the corner of the, uh, of the shack. So Aldo Leopold died just a couple of days ago in, in 1948. Um, today, keeping phenological records has become um, almost an obsession with citizen scientists. There are lots of mechanisms now that allow people who are out observing nature to not only jot down their uh, observations in a notebook, um, they can upload them using their smartphone and send them directly to the central databases where they can be incorporated with observations from thousands of other observers to help scientists studying climate change make sense out of things. The National Phenological Network for plants, eBird, uh, for, for birds, uh, are just remarkable databases. The eBird is the 300-pound gorilla of databases now. It actually monitors bird migrations across North America in real time. And the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and eBird is a significant user of the Cornell supercomputer because they do all of this amazing analysis of the observations from tens of thousands of bird watchers across the country in real time. Right now, it's fun to go online and look at something like a wood thrush. And you can actually almost hour by hour see them working their way northward, um, sort of anticipating when they're going to arrive in North America or in, in, in Wisconsin. So now phenology has sort of had a, a renaissance and it's become once again a very respected uh, field of science, especially revealing how plants and animals are responding to climate change. But as Aldo Leopold said so long ago, keeping those records, it's really all about noting the good times that you've had out in the field, the pleasure of the search, if you will. But now, perhaps you have an obligation to leave some records behind so that scientists can look at your observations and make order, figure out the order and meaning in the things that you've observed. So, thank you. Does the camera keep going for questions? Will you repeat the questions? I will, yeah. So the camera keeps going there? Okay, good. How many of you have contributed to any of those citizen science databases? It's really kind of fun to do that and then to see, you know, all of these observations coming in and how your observations sort of match up with other people's.
And indeed, just as there was among the Leopold children, there can be some competition to see who sees the first wood thrush of the year in Madison. Yeah? Um, I'm wondering if the study will be as effective by recording the events in fall, let's say when the tree started to dissipate or when the birds started to be. Yeah, the question is about other seasons of the year. Um, and phenology traditionally has made its most accurate observations of the first occurrence of the year. It's kind of difficult to do the last one. So the fall data, yes, there are fall phenological data. It turns out there's a, it's messy. And in fact, phenological data is messy data, no question about it. So there's a lot of noise in the system. And you can probably figure out where the noise comes from. There's the signal of when the event actually happens, and then there's when does the observer actually notice it. There can be a disconnect, and as more and more citizen science is happening, they even have a name for it. It's called the weekend bias. Most citizen scientists are out collecting data on the weekends, which means something that they saw on Saturday could have happened on Monday. So it's a systematic reporting late. And it turns out the same thing was happening with the Leopold data set. All the Leopold and the family only went up to the shack on weekends. Nina, his daughter, she lived there. She was out every day. So when we compare then versus now, we have to use a correction factor for this weekend bias in, in all those earlier data. It was another one of the, it was a criticism that fortunately the climate change deniers were unaware of when they criticized Nina's paper, but it is a problem, so you have to correct for it. Yes? What are some of the um, most serious, in terms of consequences um, for the natural environment, and the most serious phenological mismatches that those of you who, who practice phenology. Pretty much right here. Where are the mismatches likely to be the worst? It probably gets worse as you go to higher and higher latitudes. Okay. So we are probably in that area where the phenological mismatches are going to be particularly bad. So North America, Europe, probably a lot worse than Central America or the Caribbean, places well, like that. Equated. Yeah, Because remember, the mismatches are often caused by one species responding to photo period and another one to temperature. Right. And the difference between photo period and what's happening with climate change tends to be more pronounced as you go to higher latitudes. Yeah? Maybe along those same lines, of, I was curious if you're starting to see any evidence of the photo ones uh, responding. Uh, you know, if they're coming up late, you'd think at some level they would start responding at a, at a much slower pace, but is there any evidence yet of that in the data? Yeah, actually now the eBird program is starting to look at that. They have enough years of observations that they are starting to see some evidence of essentially natural selection favoring those individuals that are early birds that are, are, are arriving early. And it makes sense that they would shift slowly. They had to in the past, for heaven's sakes. We know over the last you know, tens of thousands of years, the climate has changed quite a bit. So we know that they have to adjust. The question today, of course, is the pace at which the climate is changing in comparison to the pace at which it changed in the past in which these organisms have essentially evolved the capacity to, to adapt to. When it shifts too fast, you're sort of outside their ability to, to adapt in a timely fashion. But yes, you certainly will over time see some of these species starting to, to make shifts. Did Waldo ever make the connection that the changes in phenology that he was observing was due to um, like climate change or increases in CO2? Like, I don't think that like, climate change, you know, uh, that, that term didn't exist back then. So what did he attribute to these changes that he was observing? Well, the question was whether, you know, Aldo Leopold mentioned anything or uh, understood that climate change might be uh, something driving these types of phenological observations. And, of course, he wasn't aware. 
if he had read some of the uh, physical papers that talked about the greenhouse gas effect, um, he might have anticipated it. He didn't. But what he did, of course, was even over just a decade, was observe the difference between warm years or warm springs and cold springs. So to some extent, he laid the groundwork based on, you might say, natural variation just from year to year that now is kind of exacerbated by the overarching global climate change. So no, Leopold didn't know about some of the things that we would be worried about today, but Leopold was pretty remarkable in how many things he was thinking way ahead of his contemporaries. So for example, I mean, he, was, he wrote one of the first mentions of DDT as a problem for wildlife. In 1945, that was the year that DDT sort of left military use and became available as an agricultural chemical. And Aldo Leopold wrote brilliantly about, you know, these chemicals like DDT that are coming out of the war effort are going to have horrible ecological consequences. No one else was thinking about that at the time. So indeed, you know, we're often in awe of people like Aldo Leopold who seem to have that amazing capacity to sort of think outside the box. And it's hard to say that they were predicting something, but that they recognized a trend that other people hadn't seen um, at the time. Yes? Speaking of climate change in part of the world, I quote often this fact that the amount of time the lakes are closed has mm -hmm. decreased from four months to three months. Has that continued in recent years or has it leveled off? No, it's still an ongoing trend. The Limnology Center has kept track of those things since uh, since Burge's day back in 18, what was it, 1870? Help me out. Long, hmm? long time. Yeah, yeah. So they've got this, in fact, I mean, it sort of put the Limnology Center on the, on the climate change map because they are the custodian of all of these records of lakes in Wisconsin. So they had freeze up and, and thaw data. And in fact, you know, that is a pretty good sort of barometer, if you will, an indicator of what's happening to the average spring temperatures is when, when the lakes break up. Yes? Did uh, Aldo Leopold cross paths with Ben Potter? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Aldo Leopold interacted um, much more than you might have imagined, given that he was kind of the odd bird out in the College of Agriculture. But he was very interactive with the rest of the faculty and encouraged his students often to have people in tangential fields on their committee. So he often had biochemists and geneticists and physiologists on his students' committee looking at ecological problems. So Van's book, Bioethics, yeah. was influenced uh, certainly that by their crossing paths. I'm sure that I'm sure it was. Uh, you know, Potter's book on bioethics was primarily looking at ethics in essentially a, a biomedical context. Uh, but using some of the same arguments that Leopold did about our relationship with nature. Yes. Oh, yeah, I'm curious about um, uh, you mentioned starlings. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you have any other examples of um, invasive species that like creating these phenological mismatches or situations worse. Yeah, it's kind of a perverse pattern that a lot of our worst invasive species are also responding really strongly to climate change. So it's happening right now. Just go out in the woods and look at the plants that have gotten a head start. Garlic mustard, for example, uh, blooms earlier than a lot of the competing understory woodland plants. And if you're competing, <laughs> getting there first, doing your thing first, gives you a competitive, competitive edge. It's already leaving out the garlic. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of a, a perverse pattern that um, a lot of these invasive species, I guess, are coming you know, from Europe and Asia, from northern climates where you might expect that they would be adapting. All right. Well, thank you all. And don't forget your homework assignment for those of you.
that didn't read a Sand County Almanac, get yourself a copy. It's a nice short little book. You can easily uh, read it uh, in a weekend. And uh, I guarantee, especially after learning a little bit about Aldo Leopold, you'll enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.